News at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Anyone seeking their pre stamp of approval for a religious exemption from the COVID-19 vaccine won't be getting it, at least from clergy in the Archdiocese of San Antonio. In a recent Facebook post, the Archbishop said everyone who is medically able to be vaccinated is encouraged to do so, and that the clergy of the Archdiocese will not be signing or providing any letters of religious exemption. However, Garrett Berger tells us that's not quite the same as complete opposition to people opting out. Our message is Please be vaccinated. It's an act of charity. It's an act of love. The Archbishop of San Antonio, Gustavo Garcia Sierra, is very much in favor of getting vaccinated against COVID-19 and says any of the three choices available, Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson, are morally acceptable. We promote vaccination and we don't give exceptions. But the Archdiocese position still cracks the door open for people to get exemptions. It just won't be with the Archdiocese official sign off. Everyone is responsible for making their own decision, he said. It has to be in the person's interest, and after the person makes a process of examination and at a level of conscience, and if the person doesn't want to be vaccinated, that's fine. They don't need somebody else to approve it. The Archbishop says because of the politics surrounding vaccination, people want him to give a decree one way or another. No, you make a decision, and hopefully you're not making a decision based on, on the politics, but based on truth and what you are finding at the level of your conscience, that is what is right, true, and just. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio police releasing new video of a car that investigators believe could be connected to a deadly shooting in a fast food drive through last week. That shooting happened at the Taco Bell in the 11,000 block of Petrenko back on August 22nd. Officers say the driver of the car pulled up beside the other car where that driver was placing his order. A few words were exchanged and then gunshots. The victim was hit twice in the shoulder and the torso. His passenger was not hurt. That suspect sped off afterward. If you have any information, you are asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. San Antonio police are looking for some help catching up to a robbery suspect. They say attacked a family dollar employee during a robbery earlier this month. This is the guy that happened at the store on Blanco Road, just south of Jackson Keller on August 16th. According to police, this guy assaulted the worker, then took merchandise from the shelves. Information that helps officers identify and arrest the suspect could be worth a cash reward from Crime Stoppers. You can call 210-224-STOP. The school year just getting started, but some local school districts say thousands of students haven't shown up to class. The executive director of the Office of Access and Enrollment Services for San Antonio ISD says staff have been working hard trying to track down these students. They've made several home visits and calls to find out why they haven't shown up. They said they don't have an exact number of how many kids have not shown up this year so far, but they have been able to connect with some families already. We have been able to um, get students to re-enroll. We've also found that a lot of their, for a lot of students, their circumstances have changed. So they've moved, um, they've changed school districts. Earlier this year, we followed as a team from Northside ISD made visits, home visits to families. The district says close to 3,000 students have not returned to their classrooms this school year. An ISD says students could have transferred or perhaps switched to homeschooling. At Northeast ISD, another roughly 3,000 have not shown up to school. In Southside ISD, meantime, 550 students are no-shows. Even in a city as diverse as it is now, there was a time when San Antonio was divided by redlining. It made getting a mortgage nearly impossible in areas like San Antonio's east and west sides. But before that, property deeds also had racial restrictions targeting Hispanics and African Americans. Federal law outlawed both practices, but those official records still have that discriminatory language in them. But now Jesse DeRiotta says a new state law will give property owners the option to have those racial covenants removed through the courts. America's seventh largest city has come a long, long way in over 300 years. Yet within these deed records at the Bear County Clerk's Office, troubling reminders of its past. Restrictions against Negroes and Mexicans, not only buying homes and property, but even where they'd be buried. 
these racial covenants shouldn't be in these deeds. It's a wound that hasn't healed yet. Those prohibitions, even though declared unconstitutional, still remain of record. The senator from Dallas says he co-sponsored SB 30 that's since become law to clean up those records. As it is, Bear County already attaches a provision to every deed declaring any restriction because of race is, quote, invalid and unenforceable under federal law. So you would know that we don't uh, condone that, we don't allow that. For instance, before becoming San Fernando Cemetery Number 3, according to Sunset Memorial Park that bought what had been Roselawn Cemetery at the time, one of the plots there has a deed that, quote, will not permit any person of Negro blood to be interred and shall not be transferred to any person or persons of Negro blood. Many deeds of homes in gentrified neighborhoods also have similar discriminatory language. There's been reports where people are shocked that they find these deeds when they purchase the house. You cannot just file directly with the county clerk and expect it to be removed. First, she says it would take a district judge ordering the racial restrictions be removed. It's a chipping away of the symbolic expressions of racism in the country. Jesse DeGollado, KSAT 12 News. Now, there was an important detail left out of the legislation. How will county clerks physically remove the discriminatory language from these old documents without damaging them? The Bear County clerk says she and other county clerks Hope to get clarification this week during a training session on Wednesday when the law goes into effect. Connecting LGBTQ youth experiencing homelessness with the resources they need to thrive. That is the mission of the Thrive Youth Center here in San Antonio. Through partnerships with local organizations and community outreach, the Thrive Center has helped get hundreds of youth off the streets. And even though this last year and a half has been challenging to connect with people, they are still making an impact. Priscilla Caraman talks with the founder of the organization, a member of the team, and a woman who is now thriving thanks to their help. Everybody has their own little story when it comes to coming out. So I didn't really come out. Uh, I got caught kissing girls, and uh, that was a a bad thing. Even in 2021, Sandra Whitley says coming out is one of the leading reasons youth become homeless. At the age of 13, Whitley was sent away by her parents. She says not being accepted for who she was made her angry. I knew, you know, what it felt like to be totally alone. LGBTQ plus youth represent as much as 40% of the homeless youth population, according to the advocacy group, The Trevor Project. Whitley founded the Thrive Youth Center in 2015. They continue to offer assistance through street outreach. There's some people that are like, I just want socks and shoes and I'm good to go. Andrea Cantu, who is part of the outreach team, says help starts with a simple conversation. And I say, hey, what's going on? Like, do you, do you want some water, especially right now with, with uh, this summer heat? Cantu says sometimes people are ready and willing to take their help, like Natalie Salazar. She was introduced to Thrive in 2018. I never thought I would, you know, need assistance. Thrive helped pay a portion of her living expenses, leaving her room to focus on graduating and starting a career. What we try to do is remove any barrier that's in their way to help them achieve what goals they want to achieve. So that I can focus on being comfortable with my own skin. That was Priscilla Caraman reporting. Efforts to help people experiencing homelessness in San Antonio don't end there. There are several organizations committed to that very mission. That is part of the focus of our new episode of KSAT Explains out tomorrow. We're following along with outreach workers on San Antonio streets while examining the issue of homeless encampments, especially after a statewide ban on those encampments was passed. We dive into who is being helped and how, plus what policies are in place that in some cases can do more more harm than good. KSAT explains homeless encampments drops tomorrow, August 31st. You can watch it on the KSAT TV app available any way you stream or on our website, ksat.com slash explains. Live cam at 608 and you can see some clouds are still out there, but nothing that we think is going to produce any more rain. Not over the Alamo City. Some other parts of our area are seeing a few isolated pop-up showers, but I think our opportunity has passed at least for the day around town. We picked up 
three hundredths of an inch at the airport. But other parts of San Antonio got a lot more rainfall than that. So if you take a look at the map here, the rainfall estimates, and you see all these little blue and green colors on the map. That's where we actually had rain today. You focus in on the northern portion of San Antonio, Chavano Park over an inch. You get into parts of Stone Oak about a quarter of an inch, closer to Fair Oaks Ranch about 15 hundredths of an inch, but the real bullseye was right up I-10. And just north of the rim in the Dominion, Leon Springs area, that's where we got a couple of inches of rainfall today. Tonight, a few lingering showers out there just through about 8 o'clock. Then we'll clear calm wind temperatures eventually falling down into the mid 70s by tomorrow morning. We'll talk about the remnants of Ida, how the rainfall hit certain parts of our aquifer and area. We'll talk about that and more opportunities for rain coming up. COVID-19 infections hitting hospitals in rural communities hard. The latest challenges on the night beat. A local business owner is dealing with the impact of another disastrous hurricane after it hit the place he was born and raised. We're talking New Orleans. He shares how his family just recently evacuated because of Hurricane Ida and how he plans to give back to those dealing with the storm's aftermath. It is back to class for students in Northeast ISD and some of those students working to remind people about safe driving habits like awareness in school zones. Our Samuel King joins us now and Samuel, they're part of the safe driving club at Johnson High School. And that's right, Steve and Myra, they say their message is especially important in the first few weeks of school as people are getting used to those school routines and teens getting used to being behind the wheel. I am going to get my license in September. I have my permit right now. <laughs> Julia Varkis is just one of the many teens learning to drive, causing their parents a lot of worry. Like high schoolers, it's very easy for us to get distracted and think that we're good enough drivers to go on our phone when that's not the case for anybody. Even before Varkis got behind the wheel, she got involved with the Johnson High School PTSA Safe Driving Club. She's now the president. It was founded back in 2012, and Melinda Cox is still the sponsor today. I wanted the children, the kids, the students of Johnson High School to have a chance to be advocates, to be empowered voices, and to say, hey, you know what, I'm new to this game, and I deserve to be able to be safe on the road. They spread their messages through signs, billboards, and speaking with public officials, recently pushing to have safe driving stickers included in all new driver packets in Texas. Anna May Quadrado comes up with much of the art for the club. She feels talking one on one to other students and her swimming teammates is just as important. It's sort of scary to know that kids my age are driving all around. Um, but I like to spread the message to my teammates and coaches and such um, just to make sure that they're being safe as well. Very important. Cox says school and district administrators have been very supportive of the students and their message. Her advice for other schools considering such a club, let the students be the guides. After all, they're the ones who are most in touch with their peers. Maybe some teens or parents or other folks on the roads this evening. This is 280 run at San Pedro. Not too far from there, we are seeing uh, some uh, issues there. Not too bad right now. Let's head over to the wall and take a closer look at the maps here. I had a crash here earlier uh, at 281 and 410. Had as clear, but we are seeing some issues a little bit to the west of there, so watch out for that. Maybe you're in the Johnson High School area this evening, uh, north of 1604, 8 to 9 minutes. Things getting a little better. And a reminder, those HOV lanes are open in both directions north of 1604. That, that can be an alternative for you when things are a little bit busy and you have someone else in a car. Looking at the rest of the area, Things are looking uh, good right now. We did have some rain earlier that Adam was talking about that did cause some issues on the roads, particularly on the northwest side, but those seem to have uh, replicated or rectified themselves, not replicated. That'd be very bad if they replicated. <laughs> Um, 18 minutes westbound on 281 to Bandera Road on 1604 right now. That's a lot better than it was about half an hour ago. 14 minutes uh, heading eastbound. So things improving like they typically do on a Monday evening as people heading to from school commute anything you want. Things look OK right now, but we'll keep an eye on it throughout the evening, guys. Thank you, Sam. By the way, did I tell you that I bought 
a car six years ago for each of my three kids. It's been through two 16-year-old drivers. Oh, it's wow. got one more to go. It's like a Timex. <laughs> Takes a beating and keeps, keeps, on, on, keeps, keeps on ticking. ticking. Yeah. So, you know, it's still got, rolling. It's got one more to go. It's so, still so what body shop has been cashing in lately? Uh, <laughs> nobody, if you look at it, you will realize no body shop has touched it yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Fair. Like I said, it's taken a beating. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about the weather. Though. Yeah, I mean, it's 85 degrees out at the end of August. That's not bad. <laughs> not bad at all. I mean, even last week, we temperatures never really got out of control. You know, they were near average because of some clouds in, in the afternoon and especially some areas of rain. And today, we had some pockets of heavy rain. Take a look at this on our KSAT Connect app part of our KSAT Weather Authority app where you can post your photos under the pins section. Mike Jones and Bernie, well, Leon Springs this afternoon. That's where this rain gauge is. 2.43 inches total in his Coco Ross rain gauge there. So that was impressive to see. And that was really the biggest bullseye around town. And there's a picture from Helotus. You can see the showers off in the distance there. And the heavier rain didn't hit everybody, but I do want to point out it hit a nice key part of our aquifer recharge zone. Aquifer is about 2.3 feet above average for the day today, but I get gritty with it and like to have a little bit more. And so we really want it right here near and just north of this purple line. That's the recharge zone and even the contributing zone is good to have it, but really right over the aquifer recharge zone, basically 1604 on the far north side, northward up to about Fair Oaks Ranch. It was a sweet spot for the rainfall today, so it was good to see that. Currently, we have a few isolated showers lingering. Most of them have come to an end. Lavaca County, a few lingering sprinkles. DeWitt County, they're coming to an end. You go westward and even south of San Antonio, Pleasanton, few isolated little quick splash and dash showers. I think you'd be lucky to even squeeze a quarter of an inch out of those. They'll be brief. Near Uvalde, just northwest of town, You've got the heavy rain, but the lightning and thunder lightning is actually reaching Uvalde here. That's why we always say when you can hear the thunder, that means lightning is within reach. It doesn't just strike where it's raining, but even outside the storms and all these outflow boundaries that are pushing southward, giving folks south of Highway 90 a nice cool breeze. You look at our rain chances in the day days ahead and they'll be isolated in nature. So coverage isn't going to be all that impressive. It'll be limited, but we'll see about 20 to 30 percent of our area actually getting some of those downpours. So if you missed out today, we have a few more opportunities every afternoon through Friday. That's the way it looks now. Of course, what you're seeing here is the remnants of Ida as this now big rainmaker continues to track off to the northeast. But we have other disturbances and storms in the tropics that we're watching. Tropical Storm Kate, this is a weak system likely to remain out over the open water, just moving due north in the Atlantic and staying east of Bermuda. And then what's likely to become our next tropical cyclone is this wave of energy coming off of Africa soon to likely turn into a tropical cyclone. And remember, the peak of the Atlantic hurricane season is September 10th. So we are approaching peak and we have a lot of activity out there. And then this little area in the Western Caribbean just needs to be monitored in the longer term for potential development. Nothing to worry about now, just something we'll keep a close eye on. 86 currently feels like 96 though. That's because of that mugginess. Dew point of 76. It is sticky outside. Look at the temperatures though. You can see what parts of Texas, Texas have had some rain. I always love just looking at the temperature map and then looking at the radar thereafter. Marfa 75, Junction 77. So you can see where we've had some of the rain cooled air. 91 meanwhile in Hondo, 97 Carrizo Springs. Not everybody's getting that cooler air from those showers. Tomorrow we'll start the day at 77, make it up to 96 for the high temperature and a few hit or miss showers and thunderstorms briefly in the afternoon, and then we do that every afternoon thereafter. Tomorrow, closer to 100 west and southwest of town. Leon Springs about 94, 94 Timberwood Park. Meanwhile, Elmendorf topping out at 98 tomorrow afternoon. More of the same the rest of this week by the weekend. Right now, it's just looking sunny and, well, mid to upper 90s. Okay, thank you, Adam. All right, the Longhorns knew coming into this year that they would need a new quarterback. The question was, which one would start, Greg? Yeah, and word leaked out over the weekend, confirmed today by head coach Steve Sarkeesian, who will be their number one quarterback when they face Louisiana this Saturday in their season opener. When we come back, we will let you know who that is. And DeMarvin Leal, the former Judson standout player, now Aggie, not shy about bragging on his D-line when we come back.
get it leaked out. The Texas star redshirt freshman Hudson Carr and over four-year quarterback Casey Thompson surprising to some considering Thompson's performance in the Valero Alamo Bowl where he came in and threw four touchdown passes in UT's 55-23 route of Colorado in the Alamo Dome. But Carr apparently beat out Thompson in fall camp after an impressive run at Lake Travis where he threw for over 2,400 yards and 24 touchdowns his senior season and ran for another five. His head coach Steve Sarkeesian worried that the quarterback that doesn't start will end the transfer portal. I can't worry about that. You know, I have to make decisions that are that are in the best interest of the entire football organization and our entire team. Um, and the moment you start worrying about the what ifs about one player, um, I think that's when you get hesitant in your decision making and, and you end up starting to make decisions that aren't in the best interest of your team. And we focus on the team first. Uh, and everything that we do, and that won't be any different when it comes to the quarterback play. And by the way, he says Thompson will see action. Texas will kick out their 2021 season this Saturday in Royal Memorial Stadium at 3.30 p.m. against Louisiana. Right now, the Longhorns are favored by nine points. Up in Aggieland, a little less of a surprise after head coach Jimbo Fisher announced that Haynes King beat out sophomore Zach Calzada to be the new starting quarterback for the Vikings Texas Aggies. King was Kellen Mond's backup last year, but due to Mond's success, didn't see much playing time. He did, however, lead his high school Longview to his first state cha championship in 2018 with 4,500 total yards on offense during his high school career with 42 touchdowns, another eight on the ground. But when the Aggies kick off their season this Saturday against Kent State, they're going to rely heavily on their defense, anchored by former Judson standout DeMarvin Leal, who's not shot about bragging on his D-line. This year we have um, basically the same guys besides Bobby Brown. So we have McKinley Jackson, Michael Clemens, uh, Darius Jones, Jaden PV. Even got new guys coming in, the new guys that came in, Shamar Turner, to me say, um, man, it, the experience that we have and the size is, is unmatched. And I definitely say that we have the best defense line in the country. There you go. Kick off at Kyle Field set for 7 p.m. where the Aggies are 28 and a half point favors. The Oklahoma Tulane game that was originally set to kick off at 11 a.m. this Saturday at home with the Green Wave has been moved to Norman following Hurricane Ida. Tulane had already moved to Birmingham for preparations. Now the game has also been moved, still believed to be 11 a.m. live here on KSAT 12. The big game and our big game coverage this Friday night will feature number three Steel against number four Reagan at Linhoff Stadium. That's after the Steel Knights manhandled Pflugerville Hendrickson in their season opener 35 to 14 at Linhoff last Friday night with the Reagan Rattlers who dropped from number two and 12 top 12 to number four this week after losing their season opener to the number one ranked Brennan Bears 35 14. Now the two collide before opening district play next week for Reagan. It was a great game last week, but we definitely need to fix on a couple things. We'll even couple things on offense, um, but definitely looking forward to getting after them. They're physical. They're going to come off the ball. They got some big dudes up front, um, so we're going to have to stay low. We're going to have to be physical up front, and we're definitely it's definitely going to be a fight in the trenches. We definitely go into the game trying to play our brand of football. Um, instruction from our coaches. We should. I think we should be fine. Um, we play as a team, play fast and play physical, and we go out there hoping for the best. It's good experience, get us ready for the district games. It will definitely be a playoff atmosphere because, I mean, they beat us last year, so this is going to be a way better game. Oh, a little payback time. Kickoff at Linhaw Stadium on Friday night is set for 7 p.m. And we, to our knowledge, this is our first COVID cancellation. The Hondo Independent School District announcing today their game against Lytle out of abundance of caution has been called off for this Friday night. Wow. Mm -hmm. First of, we hope not more. To we come. hope that's it. We'll see yeah. what happens. Thanks, Greg. Our KSAP Q&A is coming up next. In a lot of ways, his district has been leading the way when it comes to mask and vaccine requirements in the brand new school year. So in today's KSAT Q&A, to talk about that and more, we are joined by San Antonio ISD Superintendent Pedro Martinez. Thanks so much for sharing some time here this evening with us. And I want to start first with talking about why your district decided to require masks and vaccines for employees when all the while the, gover the governor rather has had an executive order prohibiting those things. Why were those decisions made? You know, early on, you know, we started the school year on August 9th, and even before that, we had a two-week summer program. We had about 25% of our students, over 90% of our schools were open, and it was a soft opening. And what we saw right away was, first of all, the, the positivity rate in the community was reaching an all-time high, over 21%. We, we had COVID tested before the school year started, and so we could see cases already were starting. We were starting to see cases, especially in our students, and so, you know, shortly after we started school, we just decided to go ahead and put a mask mandate. 
But we see a mask mandate is just a very uh, essential safety uh, safe, safety uh, uh, protocol right now. We see the solution to, to get through this pandemic is around vaccines. Over 90% of my staff, we feel uh, we have anecdotal evidence that they're vaccinated. But here's the issue. With the governor's orders, I can't even ask for proof of vaccination from either staff or from students. And we said, you know, we have a, we have many of some of our neighbors that still have a high percentage of both adults and students that are eligible that are not vaccinated. So we want to lead by example. It's not about politics. It's about stability and safety. We have to have stability in the classrooms. We're seeing more cases uh, statewide, not only of COVID cases overall, but of children. And we're seeing more hospitalization of children. And so for us, it really is about safety. And I got to make sure that our classrooms are stable. When we're having cases and we have to quarantine individuals, it creates instability in the classrooms and it affects everybody. What are you seeing in your classrooms right now? So we're averaging. So the great, the great news is that we have very strong uh, safety guidelines. You know, I have the trust of our teachers and parents. We're seeing on average about under 200 cases uh, every week with about 46,000 students that we have in person right now. The challenge that I see though is not so much the cases, but the fact that it, it affects, we have to quarantine other individuals. So right now, you know, we're seeing an average, you know, close to a thousand between mostly students, between uh, students and staff that are having a quarantine. And for us, by the way, when you look at other districts that are open, we're actually doing much better than other districts, but it is really a function of what's happening in the community because cases are still very high. And one of the things that we're seeing is that most of the cases are from unvaccinated individuals. And for us, that is the fear we have since so many of our children are still not eligible for vaccines. SAISD is now going to require vaccines for employees. I believe the deadline is, is mid-October at this point. But we saw the governor, Governor Abbott, issue another executive order last week saying that even with full FDA approval, government entities, including school districts, cannot do that. So is that something that now SAISD plans to push back on? Now, you know, well, I'll tell you, we sent the notice to our staff and parents that regardless of what happens with the executive orders or in the courts, we will continue both our masking mandate and vaccine mandate. And this is why, what, as we're seeing cases rise, as we are, our goals are around stability and safety. These are minimum expectations that parents have of me. These are minimum expectations that our community has. I am getting no pushback from staff. I'm getting no pushback from parents. And for us, we know that if we're gonna have a strong academic year, we need to make sure that our children are safe and that our staff are safe. I'll tell you, you know, I, I am very concerned about this year. This year could be another year where we have another loss in significant academics and it just disproportionately affects our families of poverty. Over 90% of my children live in poverty. It's not fair to them. So it's not about politics. I'm not trying to pick a fight with anybody. It is just basic common sense. We are in a war with this pandemic we have to be on the same side. And it is about essential safety procedures like masking, as well as we need to make sure that all of our staff are vaccinated. We gotta make sure they get their boosters and we gotta get our community vaccinated. This is not politics, it's pure safety and really common sense. How, how badly or how hurt was SAISD last year during the pandemic? You know, we, so I'll tell you, you know, what was happening in our, in our community is that the death rates in my zip codes were five times higher than in the North. And so I had, you know, many of my parents are essential workers. They're working in the supermarkets, they're working in the restaurants. And so they don't have a choice. They can't work from home. And so because of that, we had a phase in our staff. We had a phase in our students. We saw many of our children that struggled academically, but what we saw more importantly was the, all of our children had mental health challenges. So I'll just give you one, one very sad statistic. I've been here now, this is my seventh year. I, we, before COVID, we had no suicides in our schools. Last year, we had four suicides, mm. including a seventh grader in, in the school where my, my daughter attends. So this is serious. This is about, this is truly about making sure that our community is safe and that we protect their mental health and their social and emotional well-being, as well as their academics. I find it so interesting. You said you're getting no pushback from parents, getting no pushback from staff, because that's certainly not the case that we have seen in other school districts in our area and across the country. Some very heated, contentious school board meetings discussing masks and vaccines. Why do you think you're not seeing that in SAISD? Because we we spent the time last year building the trust and relationships. You know, we have many uh, much evidence, whether it's survey data, other just, just just things that we've gathered that shows that our parents and teachers have never had better communication. 
Uh, the parents and the relationships with their schools have never been better, has never been stronger. Our parents and teachers over, with over 90% support uh, approved adding 30 additional instructional days to our calendar. The summer program that we had was, was the largest we've ever had for two weeks. Over 90% of the parents said that it, it met or exceeded their expectations. Over 70% said it far exceeded their expectations. And we saw the same with our teachers. And so we are in sync with our community. And that's why for me, you know, it was, it's disappointing, frankly, that I have to be distracted by the politics because again, I know my community and I know what my community expects of me and that's what we're trying to deliver. I know there's a lot going on COVID wise and, and you know, like you said, being distracted by the politics and things like that. Before we let you go, there are talks out there that you may be one of the favorites for the job at the Chicago Independent School District. How are you dealing with those rumors and is there any truth to those rumors? So, you know, Chicago is my hometown. Uh, and so it, it is an opportunity that my wife and I decided that we just at least needed to explore. It's still very early, but I'll tell you, I am excited about the work we're doing in San Antonio. I'm excited about how we're partnering with the community and all the amazing gains we made here in San Antonio. So my wife and I said that we're going to allow the process to play out. But I'll tell you, uh, I am proud of what we're doing here in San Antonio, and I am going to make sure that our district continues to be safe. We have an amazing board and I have an amazing team. SEISD Superintendent Pedro Martinez, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you for having me. Take care. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. A couple of construction related closures to tell you about this evening. Uh, this first one we'll tell you about this is on the northeast side. This is Loop 1604 at I-35 uh, southbound here. So that's going to be closed overnight beginning at 1 a.m. But this does last until 8 a.m. So that's a little different from what we usually see. So keep that in mind if you're traveling on the northeast side uh, overnight and into the morning commute tomorrow. Uh, closure there northbound 1604 to I-35 southbound. Looking at the rest of the area, uh, traffic wise things looking a little bit better, but we do again have some uh, closures here. Also on the northwest side, this is 1604 from Bandera to I-10. Some alternating closures that started last night. This is going to run from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. through September 10th as part of that major project we've been telling you about here on the northwest side between I-10 and Bandera Road. Looking at that right now, uh, can't doesn't get much better than this. 11 minutes eastbound Bandera to 281, uh, 13 minutes heading the other way. So uh, things looking good right now, but expect there will be some more delays in a couple of hours here as that closure does ramp up. In the green, we usually don't see that. Also seeing some slowdowns uh, for our friends south of San Antonio, south of Lytle on 35. You're down to 12 uh, minutes there. And finally, some road debris there on 90 at Zarzamora. So watch out for that, guys. Thank you, Samuel. Let's take a look outside with live cam. Got some dark clouds out there. We saw some rain, some people lucky enough today. Any more where that came from, Adam? Yeah, if you missed out on the opportunity today, you'll have another chance every afternoon, basically the rest of this week. The coverage is going to be limited, though, so don't get your hopes too high. 95, that was our high temperature for the day. That's one degree above average at the airport, officially three hundredths of an inch. That's all we picked up. But other parts of town, especially far north side and up I-10 north of San Antonio, an inch to, to over two inches. Some folks were lucky today. 86 now will be down in the 70s later tonight. We'll see you in a bit to talk about the remnants of Ida and more systems we're watching in the tropics coming up. Nice to see some rain today and these temperatures. 86? 86. No, Not bad. Great. Yeah, we were actually down in the 70s when the rain hit. We dropped down to about 76, 77 for a little bit. So that was a nice change for some parts of San Antonio. That was particularly the north side of town and even at the airport. But uh, Stinson and south side, you didn't get that break, unfortunately, but there are more opportunities. Let's take a look at the radar and what we actually have out there, which really isn't much. Uh, it's just highly isolated. Coverage is limited, and even those brief downpours we were looking at earlier near Pleasanton have really come to an end. They've rained themselves out, and northwest of Uvalde, that downpour with a little bit of lightning and thunder is starting to rain itself out, but it has kicked out some outflow boundaries pushing south. That'll give some folks south of Highway 90 a cool breeze. All right, looking ahead here, the rest of the state, we had some areas of showers, and it's going to be the same basically every afternoon the rest of this week. We'll have a few widely separated showers and thunderstorms dotting the landscape during the afternoon hours. 
What really stands out here, of course, is the big swirl moving over Jackson, Mississippi and heavy rainfall associated with the thunderstorms. That's the remnants of Hurricane Ida that continues to track to the north and then steer off to the northeast. Now it's turned into a big rainmaker. So flash flooding becomes the concern now as this moves northward up into the Appalachians and then curves to the east and northeast. But there's other uh, elements we're watching in the trap tropics. And first we have tropical storm Kate out in the central Atlantic, likely to stay over the open water, just pushing northward. Not really a concern. And then we also have this new tropical wave that's coming off of Africa, which is likely to turn into our next tropical cyclone. So that could even become our next hurricane that we need to keep a close eye on. Otherwise, just more long term. We'll keep an eye on the Western Caribbean here as there is the potential, a slight chance something may start to come together, you know, within the next five or more days. Otherwise, our rain chances around here are all just dependent on the pop up afternoon showers and thunderstorms. So every afternoon, about 20 to 30% of our area will get hit by some of those rogue brief downpours. But as we saw today, some of those downpours can leave one to two inches of rain in their wake. At the airport officially, 0.03. 95, that was our high temperature today. That's just one degree above average. The low 75, pretty close to average as well. So seasonable, and we're gonna remain near average the rest of this week. But you notice the mugginess out there. Dew point of 76, it is very sticky. And of course, rainfall adds to that mugginess, which is good because it's nice to have soil moisture. You just feel the mugginess out there. So it's 86, but feels like it's 10 degrees warmer than the actual air temperature. Where we didn't get rainfall, back up near 100, Catula 101, Laredo 101, 91 in Hondo, 90 in Gonzales, 94 Kennedy, and meanwhile you look lo locally, Bull Verde is 87 and Rio Medina right now at 89. Temperatures not outrageous for this time of year, and we don't expect them to get that way. Tomorrow will be about 96, 97 for the high temperature. We'll have a mixture of sun and clouds. Some of those clouds bubbling up into a few brief downpours here and there in isolated locations by tomorrow afternoon. And most of us well into the 90s. That's 98 Beeville, 98 Pleasanton, 93 Kerrville, uh, Lotus about 93, Converse 97 in Von Army, a high temperature of 96. And that's pretty much the same the rest of this week. So if you missed out on the rain today, we have a few more opportunities. Just don't get your hopes too high because the coverage will be uh, limited. And then the weekend, as of now, looking dry. All right. Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. We now know the name of a man killed in a wrong way crash yesterday morning on the city's north side. 24 year old Diego Soto was driving east in the westbound lanes of Loop 410 near Jackson Keller. This was Sunday morning around 2 a.m. That's where police say he crashed into a pickup truck head on. The driver of the pickup truck was taken to University Hospital in serious condition and Soto was pronounced dead there at the scene. A man killed in a fire on the city's south side yesterday identified as 67 year old Roger Fetty. Responders put the fire out quickly but found Fetty laying on the floor of that home. He died at the scene. The cause of that fire is still under investigation. The last U.S. evacuation plane has now left Afghanistan, marking the official end of America's 20 year war. Tonight's withdrawal signifies both the end of the military component of the evacuation, but also the end of the nearly 20 year mission that began in Afghanistan shortly after September 11, 2001. Right down to the final hours, the Pentagon says U.S. troops were under heavy security threats. Sunday night, U.S. forces using a missile defense system to intercept one of five rockets fired at the Kabul airport. Three other rockets landing off the airfield. Texas is sending help to Louisiana in the aftermath of Hurricane Ida. Governor Greg Abbott has sent a helicopter, 14 crew members, 30 fire engines, and more than 100 firefighters to assist with recovery efforts. In a statement, the governor said Texas is proud to support Louisiana and will never forget the kindness, generosity, and support offered by the people of Louisiana during, during Hurricane Harvey. <laughs> 
If you want your ice cream, coffee, or pretty much anything to taste like a Twix bar, this product could be for you. Twix Shaker Seasoning. Hmm. The idea here, you can sprinkle the stuff on anything, and it will add the cookie, caramel, and milk chocolate taste of the famous twin candy sticks. B&G Foods appears to be suggesting it should be added to dessert. <laughs> Probably a good choice, but the sky's <laughs> the limit to what you can shake the seasoning on top of. How far you want to take it is a personal choice. The new seasoning blend is debuting Wednesday at Sam's Club. From there, it is slated to hit other grocers in the coming months. Twix shakers. And let your imagination run wild. Yeah. Or don't let it run wild. <laughs> That's some of the best news all day. Yeah. I, I can't wait, I can't <laughs> wait for, for that. Uh, things looking pretty good, too, on, on the roads for now. But here's a reminder about some uh, closures or lane closures coming up tonight. Some alternating closures on Loop 410 on the east side between 35 and I-10. Let's take you over to the northwest side again. Some lane closures tonight through September 10th from Bandera to I-10 on 1604. And just a reminder about this is I-10 in Frio. Things are looking pretty good there, but also some road debris at them on 90 at Zarza Moore. So watch out for that. And tomorrow's going to be a lot like today. We'll make it into the 90s again, average for this time of year. Bernie, 93, New Braunfels, about 97. Lackland area, 97, and Converse, 97 for the high. Some pop-up afternoon showers and thunderstorms, isolated in nature all the way through Friday. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the News at 6. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10. After the ultimate surfer, I'm intrigued by that.